The overall purpose of field day is twofold. First, it's an opportunity for amateur radio operators to test their ability to set up in the field, communicate across short and long distances with different uh, various frequency bands. Um, and then second, it's an opportunity to showcase what amateur radio can do for agencies like police, fire, um, emergency management, um, as well as what amateur radio offers the general public. Amateur radio is still very much alive, and their success is one of the critical keys to public safety. Oh, On Friday, June 26, oh, in a dusty God. field southwest of Lodi, California, the Stockton Delta Amateur Radio Club gathered to erect antennas essential to amateur radio emergency communications. This antenna is called a hex beam. It is two elements on one, two, three, four, five different bands. You get this one. That you the get. different bands are just like different musical instruments. The size makes a difference of how that resonates, just like a musical instrument. So when an orchestra has lots of different size instruments, we have different size antennas for different bands, they call it. And just as in music, the low frequencies travel through the walls of your house and the high frequencies don't. Same thing with radio. The shorter frequencies go straight and, and their local communications like we might use at a at a walkathon or a bikeathon for communications, as compared to the low frequencies that travel worldwide and cover the earth. And so that's why we have different size antennas for the different frequencies and different bands. There'll be several different types of antennas being raised this weekend for field day. This one's called a hex beam, and sometimes the ham operators can even get tangled up in their own web. If you look at a standard spider web, it's the mother nature, and you look at the numbers, the, the sizes of spider web and the spacing, it all comes out to be the same thing. This is a loop antenna, and these typically can be used for any number of frequencies, from the lower frequencies all the way up to the, to the highest frequencies. Um, today, it's being used... I, I, I was told, I can't remember what band, what frequency, said he was using it just for listening. But these things are great because they are very, very flexible and can be used for any number of things. So what we're looking at here is called an 8040 dipole, and it's designed for the lower frequencies in the shortwave band. Um, so it needs to be high, um, and it needs to, uh, it's, it's facing north and south, or it's pointed north and south, but it's really facing east and west. So we do it this way so that, because we're on the west coast, the energy radiates off the side, so it goes toward the east, some of it goes toward the west. Um, it has to be high because of the low frequency, it needs to be high up off the ground so the ground doesn't influence the, that radiation pattern for the antenna. So at night, when, uh, when the lower frequencies kind of come alive, they get um, this antenna will work across the country, even into Europe um, and into the Hawaii, Pacific Islands, um, even as far as Australia or Japan. This is a very efficient beam antenna that was right that here. Is cut for 140 megahertz or the two meter band. And uh, it's very efficient in that this is the driven element, meaning this is where the coax cable comes in and the power is applied. This is a reflector. Anything coming off of here reflects off of this and goes forward. These are called directors and they suck the energy out so it goes out where you point it. North, Five. south, east, west. And it's much more efficient uh, than just a wire in the air that s sends signals out on both sides. So you get a strong signal going out there. You get very weak signal out here behind. Uh, anybody who gets started in ham radio should understand what a beam antenna looks like and how it works. Uh, how a vertical antenna, which is just 
just straight up and down without these elements on it. Now that sends a signal in a circle all the way around. The joke is that a vertical antenna radiates power, equal, poor power, equally in all directions. In addition to the type of antenna used, ham radio operators also consider orientation. Well, so, yeah, so in an emergency for something in California, we turn it 90 degrees because we're in the middle of the state and we want the radiation to happen north and south. And we would also lower it because what lowering the antenna does is um, concentrate the energy closer to the antenna. Whereas for field day, because we want to talk as far as we can talk, we've raised up the middle. But in an emergency, you'd see, uh, you'd see this middle span probably about half the height. And that would, that would give it a range of about 600 miles, which would cover the entire state. What we have here is another example of a dipole. Like the one in front, it's basically two wires uh, separated by a center connector. In this case, we're using ladder line to, to feed the antenna the RF energy from the radios. That allows the antenna to be much broader, cover a lot uh, bigger portion of the shortwave spectrum. Um, than the uh, than the antenna out front. Plus, this one, if you notice, is oriented east and west, so the radiation is going to be north and south. So we're going to use this one to communicate to like Washington and then maybe down to Southern California and into Mexico. The KI Zero station, please come again. Ham radio clubs in North America take part in these exercises, monitored and supported by the ARRL which is the American Radio Relay League. I'm on the board of directors of the American Radio Relay League, and uh, my role is to sort of set policy and direction for the league. Um, we come out to these field day sites to say hello to everybody, show our support. This field day is an American Radio Relay League, uh, sort of a contest, if you will, but it's more like an emergency exercise. Since we have operators from almost everywhere and who live in all kinds of places, having them in various different locations, you never know where an emergency is going to arise. It could be anywhere. And it could be that a part of this emergency, a person who needs to have uh, a way to communicate outside, um, yeah. could be in a difficult to get to location. And there's a high probability that some ham radio operator is going to be nearby. And that person is an independent operator. They don't have a fixed radio. They don't have a fixed antenna system. So they can do what is needed to be able to communicate that next hop to someone else who can take the message on to the next place and the next place and make sure that we actually get communication. You know, we're called the American Radio Relay League for a reason because we relay messages. Pick almost any natural disaster, probably here locally, I think the biggest deployment of amateur radio operators were in the floods in the Lathrop area about 20 years ago. Um, but since then, the Paradise Fire had a large deployment of amateur radio operators because, you know, as you're aware, in that situation, um, you know, thousands of cell towers were destroyed by the fire. When cell towers are destroyed, that communication and all the infrastructure that supported it goes away. Um, and amateur radio operators are able to come in, establish quickly emergency communication links like this, and then augment um, the, the work of public safety and disaster management, the Red Cross, the different agencies that need to come in and make sure people are safe, then need to come in and help people make the corner and turn the corner to recovery, and all of that is supported by amateur radio. Um, the, the big uh, hurricane a couple years ago in Puerto Rico is another example, not necessarily locally, but uh, we sent, the ARRL sent amateur radio operators from across the country to Puerto Rico with what are called go kits, and we'll actually have a couple of them here tomorrow. Um, or we'll have a couple of them here, and those go kits were designed to be set up in an two hour time in the field and connect with each other and establish communication links. Those same ham operators proved to be a valuable engineering resource for local government because they had nobody to really help bring up the, the infrastructure that was damaged. So a lot of hams ended up getting hands on into repairing and getting the, the island's technology not too dissimilar from things like the Paradise Fire and the 
the fires over in the North Bay. Amateur radio goes beyond emergency communications. Clubs and members also perform community service at local events. In addition, our local governments also call on the amateur radio community for things like the upcoming 4th of July parade where uh, ham operators are going to be really the eyes and ears of the parade so that the police and fire have trained responders along the route um, to recognize if there's an incident, report it, um, and then appropriately respond as needed. Okay, we copied that. Uh, we are a 6 Alpha San Joaquin Valley. Operators work making contacts throughout the daytime hours, into the night, and early morning. I copy. One Delta, Bravo Charlie. Victor, Quebec, Kilowatt. One Bravo, Idaho. 07 Juliet Oscar. So 2021 field day is, is wrapped up. The, the contest is over and now comes the job of uh, putting away the rest of the stations. A couple of them we put put away early this morning. Um, but uh, all the computers and logs then get compiled into one log that we submit to the ARRL with our score. Um, and then everything else goes back in its boxes or in the case of my radios, they go back on the desk at home. So. QSL, QSL, 73, my friend, and good luck.